How much the excitement level is going to go up talking about taxes? Blood pressure will. Blood pressure will go down. That's important. There we go. We'll get the blood pressure down. That's, that's exactly it. Um, is this the full screen, Dan? Yes, that's as big as it gets. Okay. All right. So again, thanks for, for having us here. Um, this is about a, an hour presentation, but we, we figured we'd try and keep it to half an hour going over information, and then if you have questions, we'll be free to answer, we'll be happy to answer those. But if you have questions that come up during the presentation, since there's a lot to cover, um, feel free just to shed them out. We'll cover those as we go along. So, um, ooh, that is pretty small, isn't it? <laughs> Sorry. Oh, actually, you know what? It's, I don't think it's not. I think there's a way to make this. Yeah, there's a way to take something. Boot it up a little bit as well. See if I can do that. Back. But it looks like that is. Well, the screen is black here, that's why. Yeah. 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 But it's still the wrong. There's a big black spot in the middle. Call <laughs> 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 the shadow. Rosie said, Who's tech savvy? <laughs> 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 I really don't know how to get that any larger. But it seems as though it's on the other screen that just has the. You don't have to change the, 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 the resolution on the computer. That's not right. Windows settings. Just yeah. summarize the chart. Yeah, I just hope I can read it. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so I'll, I'll do the best I can. I apologize for the size of the, the text. Um, a little bit about us real quick. So I have a lot of corporate experience. I worked for um, Freescale Semiconductors for a couple of years in their corporate tax departments. And then five years with Temple Inlands in their corporate tax department before getting into public accounting. Um, worked in public accounting firms for seven years and then we started our own CPA firm in November of 2015 last year and it's, it's been great. Um, I was, I'm originally from Scotland as a couple of folks in the room may have already guessed. Um, my name's spelled correctly, there's two I's in there. I-A-I-N, that's the Gaelic for John, Gaelic pronunciation again. Uh, so, went to UT I know they're playing their first home game today, so look more. <laughs> um, I'm an avid cyclist. I do own a kilt, of course, as, a, as any Scotsman should, and a Scotch aficionado. Uh, David's from Laredo, moved to Austin in 2013, and has been in public accounting in Laredo, San Antonio, and Austin. 11 years in public. Uh, he graduated from Texas A&M International. Um, Daniel Laredo is a basketball enthusiast. He has worn a kilt and he borrows my scotch. <laughs> I'll give it back. <laughs> so one of the one of the things that come up when people are looking at starting a business is what type of entity should I do? Um, there are a few entities, four primarily. The easiest one is a DBA, where you don't set up an LLC with the state, you don't set up a partnership, a corporation, you're just you. Uh, it's filed on your personal tax return on Schedule C. You just report the income and the expenses. There's no need to keep a balance sheet, really, because it's not reported on the tax return. So you just look at income, expenses, lumped in with your personal taxes, no separate tax return. Easy. Um, a lot of people like to get the limited liability company set up because, as the name suggests, it provides limited liability. So the LLC is a state type of entity. A limited liability company? LLC. LLC. So the LLC is a state type of entity. So what you would do is you'd set up the LLC at the state level first. That provides you with your limited liability protection at the state level. And then once you have the LLC set up, you then decide how you want it to file for federal purposes. So if it's just owned 100% by one person, it's 100% owned LLC is disregarded meaning the IRS doesn't even acknowledge its existence, and you would file exactly the same as a DBA on your personal tax return and schedule C. Very easy. Um, you can have husband and wife team. 
um, that each operate within the LLC. Texas is a community property state, so husband and wife are still seen as one person. So it's still considered um, a sole proprietorship and still disregarded, still can be filed in Schedule C. The default, typically, for an LLC with more than one member is that it would be set up as a partnership. So if you have a non-related, um, I was going to say non-related spouse, but that doesn't really <laughs> work, does it? A non-related party um, that forms an LLC with you, that would be two members. So by default, you're automatically going to be considered a partnership at the federal level. So that would require a separate partnership tax return filing. Um, the partnership, if you're, say, 50-50 owners, you're two partners, the partnership would calculate 50% of profit, 50% of losses, allocate that 50% to each of the partners on the Schedule K-1 on the separate partnership return, and then you would take that K-1 and incorporate that into your personal tax return. The pros and cons of the partnership, pros are it's really easy to set up. Um, there's a lot of flexibility with the partnership, so you can change um, profit and loss allocation ratios, it's easy to have another partner join. Um, so if you were a 50-50 partnership, for example, and you had two members, you wouldn't necessarily have to allocate profit and loss 50-50. You could choose 60-40, 70 30 As long as a majority of the partners agree, it can be changed. Um, similar, similarly with draws, draws of profit, uh, the profit draws don't need to be in the same allocation as your ownership ratio. So instead of taking draws 50-50, it can be 60-40, 70-30, and there's no harm in doing so. Uh, let's see. I should have brought my glasses. Uh, one of, the, one of the, the bad parts about the partnership is that all of the income that flows through the partnership is considered self-employment income. So that's better. So self-employment income, it would be the same as if you were a 1099 uh, contractor, a DBA, a single member at LLC. All of the income that you earn is considered self-employment income. So it's not just subject to income tax, it's also subject to self-employment tax. Um, if you're an employee in a company, your employer would normally pay half of your self-employment tax, 7.65%, 6.2% um, Social Security, one point or 5% Medicare, uh, and then you would have the other 7.65% withheld from your paychecks, um, and that's paid into the IRS, um, into your Social Security. If you're self-employed, or if you're a partner in a partnership, you're both the employer and the employee. So you pay both sides of Social Security. You pay the 7.65% on the employer side, and 7.65% on the employee side. So not only are you paying income tax on the income that you're earning from the partnership, you're also paying 15.3% in self-employment taxes. So in theory, the self-employment tax comes back to you when you draw Social Security, if it's still around. Um, what a lot of people will do is they'll look at the S-Corp. So an S-Corp, again, is going to file, it's going to require a separate corporate partnership. S-Corp tax return filing. So it's going to be separate from your individual tax return filing. The main benefit, though, of an S-Corp is that you can pay a percentage of the profit from the S-Corp to yourself as a reasonable wage, and then the rest of the profit can come out as a draw. And the draw portion is not going to be subject to self-employment tax. So that's where the tax savings is with an S-Corp. Uh, S-Corps have more stringent rules than a partnership. So both the partnership and the S-Corp are considered flow-through entities because they don't pay tax at the entity level. They flow all of the net income through to either the partners or the shareholders. And the partners and the shareholders pick that up in their personal chain. So with an S-Corp, you would be considered an employee of the corporation. A partnership, you're considered self-employed. S-Corp, you're going to be an employee, which means the S-Corp has to pay you wages, which means it has to run payroll. It's got the payroll filings quarterly, it's got the annual reports, the W-2s, the withholding, and all that, that payroll uh, tax stuff. 
the other thing is with a, an S Corp, if you're 50-50 shareholders, then the profit or loss has to be allocated 50-50, and any contributions to the S Corp or any distributions from the S Corp also have to be made 50-50. So they have to be in proportion to the ownership ratio. If it's not done, you bust the S election, and your entity defaults to a C corporation, which you don't want. So it's important that if you do set up an S corp and say one of the, the members works more than the others, um, that member would have to be compensated through wages. You can't just take you know, an extra draw of the profits because that would bust the S election. Um, C corp is mainly for larger entities. So a C corp has double taxation. The C corp itself is taxed as a corporation. And then when the profits from the corporation are paid out to the shareholders, that's paid out as a dividend. And the dividends are taxed again when they hit the individual's tax return. Um, C corps used to be really bad uh, because the tax rate was up at 35%. Under tax reform, the tax rate for C corporations is now down to 21%. So it's a little bit better but you still have the 21% income tax rate at the C Corp level, and then you also have a 15% or 20% rate when the dividends are paid out of the C Corporation. Um, typically, you see C Corps for companies that want to issue a lot of shares, they want to have a lot of shareholders buy in. Um, it's a lot easier to do that if you're a C Corp. So those are the, the main entity types. Um, any questions on those? There will be a quiz after. I just I don't know if I mentioned that. <laughs> All right. Nobody's sleeping yet. So these are the new 2018 tax brackets. Um, hopefully you can see those. Uh, in in whole, the, the brackets have gone down. So the tax rate, the top tax rate, used to be at 39.6% prior to 2018. That's dropped down to 37%. Um, the marriage penalty is back, but it doesn't kick in until you make, if you're married, until you make 600,000 of income. So it doesn't affect any translator in the world. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I'm not sure. Oh, eclipse. <laughs> <laughs> I saw a couple of Rolls Royces at the Not ours. That was yours. But, uh, <laughs> <laughs> so you'll notice that uh, each of the tax rates are um, the rates are lower, so 10, 12, 22, 24, 32, those are all, all lower than the tax rates for 2017 and prior. But you'll notice the bottom line, um, the 37% hits at over 500,000 for individuals and at over 600,000 for married. So if you have two individuals, they could in theory earn 500,000 each, a million dollars, and still be at the 37% tax rate. Whereas a married couple, if they earned a million dollars, number one, they probably wouldn't be worrying about taxes. But number two, um, 600,000, they kick into that highest tax bracket. So that's that's what the marriage penalty is, is you kind of get penalized for being married. Can I just ask a question? Sure. That's a very, very hard very progression of between 24 and 32%. Um, all of a sudden. Did um, they do something else in between, or have they, have they reduced the, the lower progression? Um, they've reduced the lower progressions. It used to be, and David, you might be able to look this up, 2017. Um, they used to be 25%, uh, 28%, and then it jumped up to 35%. So yeah, the lower brackets have lowered a little bit. Actually, uh, there's a bigger gap between 12 and 22. There's 10 points right here. Where there's only eight points between 22 and 21. So for 2017, there were seven brackets, which is probably why there's there like there seven there too, but yeah. went from 10% to 15, to 25, oh. to 28, to 33, to 35, to 39.6 was the highest. Mm. Okay, so, so they're, yeah. they're dropping a little bit on the, the lower end, and that's, that's what yeah. tax reform was touted to do, was to reduce taxes for middle income taxpayers, in theory. Um, but yeah, that's, I'll, I'll get into a really neat thing that you can consider if you are able to get under the 12% top rate, um, you can actually take advantage of a 
right? Even if you have income, none of it's going to be taxed, which is pretty cool. Um, so those are the brackets. Uh, you can find those online if you just Google um, 2018 tax brackets, we'll pull this up for you. So under tax reform, um, there are a few changes in prior law and the new law. The new law kicks in for 2018 for the most part. And a lot of on the individual side, um, the changes that are made on the individual side sunset in 2025. So after 2025, they are supposed to revert back to what they were prior to 2018, unless something changes before then. So I know it's really hard to read, but um, under prior law, uh, you could take a personal exemption of 4,050 for yourself, your spouse, and any children that you had that were dependents. Uh, that's gone for 2018. Uh, so 4,050, you think about a family of four, you've got 16,000 of a deduction that offsets income. That's gone. That's, yeah, that's, that's a big one. Yes. It's compensated, but more if you have a family of five, then it's not so. Yeah, we've seen a little bit of research when it first came out. There's a, a, a small group that won't benefit, so it's mostly single, single parents who have more than three children. Um, won't benefit from losing that deduction and that standard deduction is going to be twice as much but it's not enough to cover what you're losing but we i mean we definitely wouldn't have put that law in there but <laughs> we can, they didn't ask us yeah they didn't I mean, wait so four make taxes. when you if you if you imagine your tax return you've got two pages to the 1040 so on the second page you calculate your adjusted gross income and then on the second page you would take your either your standard deduction or your personal Sorry, your standard deduction or your itemized deductions, whichever is higher, and then you would have your personal exemptions come off there as well. So personal exemptions are gone, but the standard deduction has increased. Um, for 2017, the standard deduction was 63.50 for single. It's up to 12,000 there for 2018. Um, 12,700 for married under prior law. It's now up to 24,000. What that's meant to do is it's meant to alleviate a lot of taxpayers from having to prepare the itemized deduction form. Um, itemized deductions would be where you would put your mortgage interest, your property taxes, uh, medical expenses above 7.5% of gross income, um, your 2% unreimbursed employee expenses, if you had any of those, uh, charitable contributions also go on there, uh, investment interest. So that's that's all in the itemized deductions form. And once you get through that form, you compare that to your standard deduction and you would take whichever one is higher. Um, so at 12,000, especially in, um, in Austin, you can imagine that your property taxes are gonna be pretty high. And then with mortgage interests and charitable contributions, you could probably exceed that 12,700 pretty easily. Um, under new law, it's now up to 24,000. So if your mortgage interest, property taxes, and contributions are less than 24, you would just take the standard deduction, which is higher. Uh, property taxes, this has been talked a lot, uh, talked about a lot in the news. Um, there's a cap on property taxes. So in the past, you could take a deduction for all of your property taxes, your, your sales tax, state and local taxes, and they would all be includable in your itemized deduction form. Going forward for 2018, the cap on that is 10,000. So if your property taxes are you know, 12,000 and then you have general sales tax on top of that, you're limited to $10,000. Um, let's see. The, the piece limitation is also gone. So the piece limitation was something that came in quite some time ago. And it basically said that if your income is over a certain threshold, the itemized deductions, your mortgage interest, your property taxes, your charitable contributions, um, are gonna be phased out because you're making too much income. Um, that level was at around 350,000. So above 350,000, they would say, all right, we'll put all your itemized deductions on this form, but then we're gonna calculate a 3% deduction for your income exceeding 350,000, it's kind of graduated. Um, and they'll phase the amount of deductions out all the way up to disallowing 80% of those itemized deductions. That's gone, which means that if you do have itemized deductions in excess of 24,000, if you're married, file and joint, 
then your contributions are not going to be limited. They're not going to be phased out. Anything else that's on that schedule is not going to be phased out. So you're going to receive the benefit of all of those deductions uh, going forward if you're a high income earner. Um, the child tax credit is increased from 1,000 to 2,000. Uh, that's a credit, it's not a deduction. So credits are typically better because you calculate your tax first and then you have a credit and that comes off dollar for dollar. Whereas a deduction is going to reduce your taxable income and then your tax is figured after the deduction. So the child tax credit increases from 1,000 per child up to 2,000 per child if they're under 17. Um, there's a, an income limitation, so if you are married, your income has to be below 140,000, your taxable income, sorry. Uh, modified adjusted gross income. It has to be under 140,000 to be able to claim the, the child tax credit. So if you think about the personal exemptions of 4,050, they were a deduction. Um, the child tax credit, if you qualify for it, that's a credit, and it's $2,000 per child. That's after taxes are calculated, so that's right off the top. Only if your income is less than 140,000 um, filing joints. And the kids are under 17. And the kids are under 17. Because we all know that after 17, the kids don't cost anything, right? <laughs> <laughs> uh, one of the things is, that's a big change for businesses, so a lot of these rules under tax reform law, if you are a sole proprietor, and you're filing your own business tax return on Schedule C and your personal tax return. Um, some of these are going to impact what you can and cannot deduct. Um, there's another slide where I'll go over in more detail um, business expenses. But one of the items that you would see a lot is if you go out and you entertain a business client or a potential client, that meal is going to be deductible at 50% um, on your taxes. So you can write off 50% of your meals if you're either in town um, entertaining a client out with a business client for business purposes, or if you're traveling overnight out of town on business. Um, you don't have to be with the client in that case. If you're traveling overnight out of town on business, then um, you can deduct 50% of your own meals. Do you have to be out of overnight? I mean, I thought it was just a distance uh, relationship, right? Does it have to be more than 50 miles away? It, it has to be somewhere where you would stay overnight. So it's it's a convenience factor. If you're not able to get home and prepare your own meal, the IRS says, okay, well, we're going to allow a deduction because you're going to have to stay overnight and you're going to incur expenses of um, having to you know, purchase a meal at a restaurant versus um, eating at home. So they allow a deduction for that. But it has to be overnight. So one of the things that we'll see sometimes is, you know, think of a, a plumber who might be traveling around Austin with his own business. Um, and he stops at you know five, ten houses within that day. If he stops off at Wendy's and picks up a meal, that's not a business meal. It's a personal meal. He wasn't traveling overnight out of town, um, and there was no business client unless he's taking his business clients to Wendy's, which probably isn't the case. So we'll see that a lot. You know, in in your head, you can justify it being a business meal because the thought might be hey, I'm driving around town, I need to eat. If I just stop in and grab a quick burger real quick, that means I can get back to uh, my business and stuff. But because you're in town, you're not out of town overnight, it's not considered a business meal. Uh, we also got a lot of doctors who um, like to stop at Starbucks in the morning and we see Starbucks in there, uh, in the ledger, but you know, again, that's a personal coffee in the way to work. But unless they stop at the office first, go to Starbucks, then it's deductible. We can go over all of those in as much detail as you want uh, after we do. Uh, unreimbursed employee expenses. So this would apply if you're an employee. Um, think of a, a mortgage uh, broker. So somebody that's going out and is an employee of you know, a big bank, and they say go out and get us mortgages. If they spend money out of their own pocket to wine and dine potential clients, and they're not reimbursed by the bank for that, that's considered an unreimbursed employee expense. So what you used to be able to do is deduct those on your itemized deduction form, but it was subject to a hurdle of 2% of your gross income. So to the extent that those expenses exceeded 2% of your gross income, you'd be able to put those on the itemized deduction um, schedule. Under 2018 tax reform, that's no longer allowed. So unreimbursed employee expenses are no longer deductible. 
which means if you are in that situation, you want to make sure that you're keeping track of the receipts and you're going to your employer and saying, hey, reimburse me for these costs because I'm not going to be able to present those in my, my tax return going forward. So if they reimburse you dollar for dollar, you're made whole, and the fact that you can't deduct them doesn't matter. And going back to the mules real quick, entertainment is no longer deductible either in 2018. So you may have gone out to a business meal with a client and you know went to a restaurant and then went to a UT football game or a baseball game. Those would both be deductible at 50% um, prior to 2018. The meal is still deductible at 50%, but the entertainment portion is no longer deductible. So that's just a non-deductible expense. What IRS said was they were seeing too many people were taking advantage of the entertainment portion and just running through everything. So they just disallowed it, unfortunately. And it's hurting everybody now. So if you do, if you are in that situation, you take out a business client, just make them pay for the, the entertainment after. Be fine. <laughs> uh, moving expenses used to be deductible as well. So if you move for a job, um, you could either have your moving expenses reimbursed by your employer, and it wasn't taxable to you, it wasn't considered additional compensation, or you could take a deduction on your personal tax return if you moved more than 50 miles for a new job. So all of your, your mileage, your um, transportation costs for all of your household items, the cost of those would all be deductible under prior law. Under current law, 2018 going forward, those are no longer deductible. Make me angry. <laughs> yeah, it's, so the reason that, that they... Put you up for corporations and it's little things for real people. Exactly, exactly. I'm going to say that to me, it looks Ooh. like not one person who's a single parent with custody of their three to four plus children worked on the first few items, for sure. I agree. Because Probably right. it is ludicrous to say we take away the personal exempt exemptions because mm -hmm. that is a per child, doesn't matter whether you're married, filing jointly, it's based on the dependents. Right. And to then jump from that to this idiotic, <laughs> okay, we're giving you 12,000, doesn't matter if you've got 10 kids or one, mm -hmm. but if you're married, you get 24, it doesn't matter. Do kids cost more when you're married? <laughs> <laughs> I'm not even going to try and answer that question. <laughs> um, am I wrong or is this just ludicrous? Yeah, I, I understand. Didn't I say it was going to get exciting talking about taxes? <laughs> yeah. And the, um, expiring, the child credit benefit expires in 10 years. Mm -hmm. So it may go back in 2026 to being able to take the exemption again. But you know, uh -huh. nobody knows that at this point. It's really based on what's passed. I really wouldn't worry about the phase out either. I mean, in 10 years, you're going to have some president, somebody running for president, who's going to say, "I'm going to give you back that child tax credit," and try. I mean, it happens. Sure. It happens every election yeah. year. I mean, as as often as we've been in it, I mean, tax law has changed so much just in the past 10 years, and it's really after every president gets elected. So. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But you are right, you do have a point, because the whole reason the tax reform came around was um, they wanted to do something for this, mainly the C corporations. So they looked at the U.S.'s tax standing uh, in the world, and we had one of the highest corporate tax rates in the world at 35%. So the main reason for tax reform was to get the corporate tax rate down. And they did that. Instead of having a graduated rate uh, up to 35%, which is actually a little 38% <coughs> bracket as well in there, they just came out and said, okay, C corporations, we're going to give you a flat 21% tax rate across the board. But then they said, well, that's not fair for the partnerships and S corps and small businesses and you know, other folks that have businesses that are still subject to the individual higher graduated tax rates all the way up to 39.6%. So that's why they started incorporating a lot of these individual um, breaks into the tax reform. It was kind of to try and make the break they were given to corporations not look as bad, or try and level the playing field some. But yeah, there's there's a lot of debate and whether it's fair and you know. I think a lot of people, especially with children, 
when they file their 2018 taxes, we'll have a rude awakening. Yeah. But uh, I would imagine that if they kept the exemptions around and they were getting the larger standard deduction, some people may complain that the people who have a lot of kids are getting too many deductions. Uh, but I think across the board, everybody is going to be in a better position, with the exception of very small Single percentage. Parents. Yeah. With Probably the people who need it the most. Exactly. But that's that's my point. Uh -huh. I wish there was another way around that. Yeah, I mean, tax rates are going to be lower overall, but yeah, there are a lot of things that are disappearing. Um, so back to the business side of things, um, when you start a business, oftentimes you're going to have a lot of startup costs. And the question that we get a lot is, are those startup costs deductible? Should I hold on to them? What do I do with them? Um, because you can, you can start, a, start incurring costs for a business in 2018, but your business may not start until 2019. So those costs are deductible, but they're only deductible if you actually start the business. Um, and they're only deductible in the year that your business actually starts. So if you're running around and you're doing research for business and you're incurring you know, mileage, travel, <coughs> um, organization costs, those are all startup expenses that are deductible, but IRS says, well, if you never actually start the business, you lose them. You used to be able to take them on the itemized deduction spreadsheet, but that, again, has, has gone. Well, what is the criteria for starting a business? Is it how do they determine when that happens? That's a good question because uh, it's a little vague. Um, it depends on the type of business that you have. So if you have um, a retail store, it's generally going to be the day that you open your doors. Mm -hmm. But you can also argue that your, your business started when you were ready to open your doors because you've got to hire employees first, you've got to train them, you've got to stock your shelves. So. Typically those things are going to happen within a 12 month period of each other, so you're going to get it in that year. It could you know, right. fall over from one year to the next, so you could be doing all the startup stuff in December and then open in January. Right. And that's when you would start looking at things and say, well, was I really ready to open in December? Um, I just couldn't open the doors yet because I still had training to do and I had inventory and I had to stock the shelves and all that stuff. Now, so if, if you're an, excuse me, if you're an interpreter or a translator, for example, mm -hmm. and you say you're ready to open your uh, business, there's no physical grand opening, and nobody has hired you yet, mm -hmm. and that and that that period, as some of us know, could go on for a, an awkward period of time. <laughs> <laughs> how, how does the IRS determine that cutoff point when you when you move mm -hmm. from preparing to open to being open, yeah. in, in this case. Yeah, um, so it's, it's a little similar to rental properties. If you're holding your rental property open for rental, in other words, if you're ready for business and you're advertising, uh -huh. the fact that you're not generating income doesn't necessarily mean that you haven't started business. Um, when you're ready to actually start and you're you're doing things that show that you're trying to earn income, mm -hmm. then your business is started. It, the business doesn't have to be profitable in order to start deducting the expenses. Mm -hmm. You can have uh, a year, you know, where in December you've started advertising and you've incurred a lot of costs and you haven't generated any income. Um, you can report all those costs on your December's tax return, whichever year that is in. It's going to look a little bit funny because on the Schedule C, if you're a self-employed individual, you're going to have zero on the income line and you're going to have a bunch of expenses. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people, of course, say, is that going to be a red flag? Am I going to get audited? What are they going to say? Um, so that's when you start looking at, you know, was I really holding myself out to generate revenue? Was I at that stage where I can, mm -hmm. where I can generate revenue? And typically, you're going to, be, of course, hold on to your receipts. Um, meal receipts, write down the business clients on there just in case of an audit. There's two favorite things that the IRS likes to go after, uh, meals and mileage. So we have a lot of clients where at the end of the year we'll ask, um, how much were your business miles? 20,000, on the dot, exactly. <laughs> Got to 20,000 and then just stopped. So that's obviously a, an estimate. Um, IRS will look at that and they see mileage and you see meals is an easy audit item because for mileage you're supposed to have contemporaneous documentation 
which means you're supposed to have a logbook or you're supposed to be tracking all of your business miles somehow. And at the end of the year, you've got an actual list of business miles and who the client was, where you went. A lot of people don't do that. And they'll just guess at the end of the year and say, yeah, that's about 20,000. And my total mileage was 32,000. So 20 over 32 is my business percentage. And then you can either take that percentage of your actual car expenses, or you can take 20,000 and multiply that by the standard mileage rate. Um, but IRS will go after that and say, show me your documentation. I don't have any, it was just an educated guess. And they'll either say, all right, sorry, disallowing the whole thing. Um, I'll meet you halfway, I'll allow 50% of it. Or you might get somebody that's in a good mood and they'll say, all right, well, show me, show me what your regular day looks like, what your regular week is, how many miles you travel in a week. And if that's consistent throughout the year, they might take a week and just multiply that by 52 and use that. Meals, they'll ask for receipts and say, you know, what was your business purpose? So if you have, if you think about your general ledger, if you use QuickBooks, for example, and you have all your meals listed in a large meals account, um, they may go into that account and say, okay, I'm going to take this little segment here, show me the receipts for this segment. And based on the ones that you're able to uh, qualify out of that segment, they'll use that ratio to determine how much of the entire account is either allowed or disallowed. And again, it depends on the auditor. They're supposed to have a set of rules that they all follow, but they have a lot of discretion. So, um, yeah, those are two they like to go after. <clears throat> so organizational costs and startup costs, there's a, a section in the code that says you can deduct up to 5,000 of organizational costs and 5,000 of startup costs in the first year um, immediately. So if your startup costs exceed 50,000, then they say, well, you can't, we're not gonna allow you a deduction of 50,000 in the first year. You're gonna have to amortize those startup costs. So those costs then become amortizable over a 15 year period. So you get one fifteenth of your startup costs that's deductible every year. But again, if it's under 5,000, then you can deduct those immediately. Um, so say for example, you, and I, I want to clarify that by saying if you if you purchase um, equipment or you purchase uh, something that's inventory or fixed assets, those are not necessarily startup costs. This would be um, research or uh, organization costs or, or travel to check out a, a facility, those type of costs. So the 50000 limit, it's really for larger companies that are going to hit that 50000 because a lot of folks aren't going to go out and spend 50000 you know, on the chance that they may be able to open the business. So under 5,000, you're fine, you can deduct those immediately in the first year. Um, if it's over 5,000 though, then you may have to amortize a portion that's over 5,000 over a five year, 15 year period. Uh, if you don't start the business, then you can deduct them. They have another rule, hobby loss rule. So they believe that some people get into business as a hobby, it's not really business. Um, what they generally look at is your business has to be profitable for um, at least one out of the first three years, or at least one out of a three year period. So you can have a loss in the first year, which a lot of people will do because you've got startup costs and you're doing a lot of advertising, you're trying to get your business name out there. The second year, you may still have losses if you know, you're still trying to build things. But if you also have a loss in the third year, then the IRS is going to say, oh, it's starting to look like a hobby, you know? Um, so at that point... A hobby or a failure? <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, it, it could be. So if, it's, if they do deem it to be a hobby or a failure, so what the IRS says is you've got to be in business with a profit motive. You've got to have the intent of generating positive income. Um, so if you get to that third year, and you still have an overall loss, you can still deduct expenses, but only to the extent that you have income. Um, so it's, it's not, all of your expenses aren't completely lost, you're just limited to the extent that you have income. And one of the things that you can consider is, you know, if, you're in, if you find yourself in that situation, 
Um, there are ways to show income in the third year, for example. Um, you may not fully depreciate your assets in the third year. You may take a, a straight line depreciation so your deduction is less, and you may have a little bit of income. So when you trigger income in that third year, then your clock starts over again. So you can have another two years of losses, potentially, but overall, um, you have to have a mindset of, of generating positive income. Um, there are situations where you can have a loss in the third year um, and still be able to deduct that loss, but you have to be able to show that there is an overall writing intent um, to generate positive income. In other words, you're in business to, to generate income. So if you do get to the third year and you have an overall net loss, you may still be able to deduct it. You're just going to have to prove that it's a good business venture. You better get a good accountant. Yeah. Yeah. Somebody that knows what they're talking about. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, you've got to generate income to pay. We, we do see um, an example might be you have a W-2 employee who's making um, a decent amount of wages for another employer. They may set up a side business uh, and it's really more of a hobby, but they're trying to categorize it as a business so that they can write off losses to offset their wage income. So that's that's really what they're going after is or, or they want to deduct all their, their fund and gain sign from the uh, from the IRS. And you like the you like woodworking and instead of paying for the wood and the tools and all that as your hobby, you declare that a business and then uh, all that becomes deductible. That's what they're trying to get away from. Yes sir. Um, if the business owns real estate, um, how can depreciation factor into those relationships with the IRS? Uh, that's a good question. So, if the business owns real estate, it depends what type of business you have. You're still going to have um, you're still going to have a depreciation deduction. Uh, generally, if it's a non-residential business that you have uh, purchased for your business, you can depreciate the tax basis of that business over a 39 year period. So the tax basis is gonna be the amount that you purchased less the cost of the land. Whatever that net number is, that's what's gonna be uh, depreciated over a 39 year period. I'm sorry, say that again? Uh, so if you, if you purchase a building for 200,000 and there's that 200,000 purchase price includes 50,000 that you paid for the land that the building sits on, your tax basis is going to be 150,000. So you would break out 150 for the building, and then 50,000 for the land. Land is not depreciable because, in theory, there's it's perpetual. It's perpetual. Um, you can't. It doesn't deteriorate over time. Um, but the building can be depreciated over a 39-year period. If you have a home office, uh, then if you're be a good builder, I can build that building. You can assume 40-year life. 40. Yeah. yeah. The stone is good. <laughs> so if you have a home office uh, or if you have rental property, there's a 27 and a half year depreciable life. But the same rule applies, you get your, your purchase price for the building less the cost of the land, and whatever the net is is going to be your tax basis, and that's depreciable over a 27 and a half year period does that for affect, residential. Yes, and then pardon me for the follow-up, but does that affect the, um, the difference in the way they look at it as far as hobby or profession on short-term gains and losses? Uh, not necessarily. It's it's still it's going to factor into whether you have an overall gain or loss in your business. Huh. So, a, a building is going to be on straight line, meaning that you can't accelerate depreciation on a building. It's going to be either 39 years or 27 and a half years. So, if you go out and you purchase a building and it's ordinary and necessary uh, for your business. Um, and you take that depreciation, if that leads to an overall loss, it's still counted in the total of all of your losses to determine if your, build, if your business is generating an overall profit. It's not an out-of-pocket expense. Um, depreciation is uh, a deduction that you take without actually having to buy something or pay for an expense. So from the standpoint of, especially in Austin, um, if you purchase a building you get the benefit of a depreciation deduction, but you don't have to pay for that deduction. Um, it's just depreciation. 
and then you also hopefully um, get appreciation in the building. So your building is actually earning money for you, but it's also providing you with a non-out-of-pocket deduction. And, and the, the rise in the value of the dirt Yes. In Austin. In Austin. Is, is that, yep. How does that factor in them? When you sell it. Well, or, or if you don't. If you sell then it doesn't affect it. If, it, if you keep it for 39 years, it's not a bad thing. <laughs> yeah, that's true. So it's, it's kind of like if you think about stocks, if um, you hold uh, stock, IBM, and you hold onto it for years and years and it's appreciating, um, you're, you're, you have an unrealized gain. Um, but you're not taxed on it because you haven't sold it. So exactly as, as Michael said, um, if your building is appreciating in value, that's not going to be a tax impact to you until you actually sell it. Thank you. When you sell it, there's going to be um, the majority of it is going to be capital gain, but you also have a recapture of depreciation that's been deducted. Um, so depreciation is an ordinary deduction offsetting ordinary income at the higher ordinary tax rates. Uh, so they make you recapture that portion that you've taken as a deduction in prior years, and that's taxed at a higher rate, and the remainder is going to be at the lower capital gains rate. Well, I think you know, I realize most of us are just looking at business expenses, so thank you so much for your sure. question. Sure, yeah, feel free to shout out any questions at all. Um, all right, so business expenses, we may have covered a few of these. Generally under section 162, um, they have to be considered ordinary and necessary business expenses. Uh, so, purchasing a Lamborghini may not be ordinary or necessary. Are you sure? Uh, it depends on your business. You could be a race car driver, perhaps. Um, when you're looking at expenses, the key is are you self-employed or are you unemployed? So if you're self-employed, you can normally deduct expenses dollar for dollar against the income that you're generating. Whereas if you're an employee and you're incurring expenses out of pocket, you may not be able to deduct those expenses. So that's why it's important, especially in 2018 going forward, to ask for reimbursement from your employer for those expenses. And what happens if you're both? Like, what happens if you are an employee part-time and self-employed the rest of the time? I mean, how does that affect that? Use? That, I think I mean, there might be more than one of us in that situation right here. Or we, we might have something that's a regular thing, I mean, maybe 15, 20 hours a, a week, and then the rest of the time we're self-employed. So how does, I mean, uh, where do we go? Right, so if, uh, if you're an employee, any expenses that you incur as an employee are gonna be subject to that, uh, previously, we're gonna be subject to that 2% disallowed unreimbursed employee expenses. But, but the rest is gonna be self-employed. Right, so you'd have to look at the expense and say, well, was it an expense that was incurred as part of my W-2 job, or was it an expense that was incurred as part of my Schedule C business 1099, 1099 income? So, um, just a bit of background, I've only been here uh, for just about a year now, I started my LLC in, in January. That's the weird thing. So okay. if you're if you imagine yourself as an employee of Dell and Dell sent you out to New York to go yeah. to a conference, you would bring back the receipt and you would say, Hey Dell, reimburse me, here's the receipts to prove that I incurred these business expenses. They would write you a check and yeah. you made whole. Exactly the same thing would happen if you are your own boss. And if I use my company credit card for those expenses? Then you're fine because that your credit card is your receipt and that's going to yeah. flow through your... So that, that's, it's okay, I don't have to use my private credit card for those sort of things, I can still keep on using the company credit card. Right, right, that's the preferable way because then at the end of the year you Absolutely. have everything right. Right. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Good question. Uh, let's see, so 1099s, um, 
If you are self-employed and you hire contractors, um, there's a requirement to send a 1099 at the end of the year to anybody that you paid $600 or more to, unless you pay them with a credit card. Um, those are going to be individuals, uh, partnerships. Um, individuals, partnerships. Yes. I don't know. Sole proprietors. Sole proprietors. So it's important if you're in that situation, what we see a lot is at the end of the year, there's a question on the tax return, every tax return, if you have a business, not if you're an employee, but if you have a Schedule C business or if you have a partnership, an S-Corp or a C-Corp, there's a question that says, um, did you pay anybody that would provide a requirement for you to issue a 1099, yes or no? If yes, did you or will you issue those 1099s, yes or no? So those have to be answered on the tax return. They go through the IRS system. And if you check yes, there were 1099s. If you have contract labor, for example, in your business and there's no 1099 that was issued, which would go into IRS so they can see which businesses have submitted uh, 1099s, uh, the penalties get pretty severe. Um, if they're not issued within 30 days of the filing date, which is now January 31st, I believe it's a $50 per 1099 penalty, and it goes all the way up to $530 per 1099 penalty if you intentionally disregard it um, issuing a 1099. Sorry. Sorry. Yeah. Are there some expenses that you pay that you do not require? I had always understood that if they, even if they had advertised as a business, like we say, a contractor, and you just paid them whatever they did, then you did not have to issue a 1099 contractor. Right, so it's primarily. Is that still true? Uh, yes. So it's primarily for individuals or partnerships. If you're paying a corporation, then you don't have to worry about 1099s. Uh -huh. If you're going to ask Walmart to purchase something, you don't have to worry about issuing. And 1099 to Walmart, although they were actually discussing doing We fit into that quite frequently because we subcontract each other. I mean, uh, a lot of times I, I, I might have two or three jobs that same day, so I might hire uh, Mr. Hansen there to cover for me in one of them. Okay. So then at the end of the year, if it's more than 600, then I do have to give him a 1099. Yes, 600 or more. So it's, it's best before you make that first payment, if you already know that you're going to exceed that $600, it's best to send them a W-9, and the W-9 is a form that says, hey, fill out your, your name, your address, your social security number, send that back to me, and then I'll send you the payments. And that way you have a W-9 at the end of the year, so you can issue them a 1099. Sir? Sorry. Go ahead. All right. Um, and if the contractor is outside the U.S. but not a U.S. taxpayer, what's the... What's the rule there? So that's a good question. Um, if the work is done outside of the U.S., then there's no obligation um, to issue a 1099 because the IRS doesn't have the right to tax that individual. But it's still a good idea to get a W-8-B-E-N, B-E-N for beneficiary. So the W-8-B-E-N basically says the person overseas is filling out this form saying that um, they are an overseas individual, they're performing all of the work overseas, and you have that just in case you get audited by IRS. So you just send it to them and they send it back? They send it back, right. yeah. There's, there's no tax, they're just so saying that. If you want to pay them, you better have the paperwork. Well, obviously the invoice is a little Right. So, related question, if my contractor is a U.S. citizen, but living overseas and doing the work overseas, then they're not paying U.S. taxes on that income? Uh, they should be, but you don't have a requirement to issue a 1099. So if the person overseas is a U.S. citizen, they still have an obligation to file a U.S. tax return, and U.S. tax is worldwide income, which means they would report that income that they earn. But if they also have to pay taxes on that income in the country in which they're in, they'll receive a, either a foreign tax credit or a foreign earned income exclusion to offset the income that they've earned overseas. But you wouldn't have an obligation to send a 1099 if all of the work is done outside of the U.S. Sir. And a follow-up question to that, if the business that you are a principal in is a foreign-owned corporation, because you incorporated in another country, such as Panama, or I don't know where it's popular now, then would the, would your, the tax free income for the U.S. citizen working for that business be part of that, I think it used to be $80,000 exemption? 
That's the uh, the foreign earned income exclusion. So if you're if you're overseas and you're working overseas, and no, but if your business is owned and incorporated in another country, your and you're a U.S. citizen, but but the the, the contractor is working for. Let me see if I can make the question. The contractor is working for an uh, international corporation outside of the U.S. Right, even though you're the one of the principals of that international corporation. Would you still be able to tell your contractor, hey, this will be part of your, what was the term? Uh, foreign, foreign, uh, foreign earned income exclusion. Yeah, well, that's, okay. is, that, is that clear? I'm sorry. Um, that's going into another realm. Well, okay, I'm, I'm, so, I'm, yeah. trying to, I'm trying to understand you. I know lots of us work with people in, in multiple <coughs> parts of the world. So This okay. is unrelated to the 1099 forms that we're talking about. Oh, thank you. Well, I, I'm thinking that if you're if you're a principal in a foreign corporation, then you would have um, obligations to file Form 5471. Oh, yes, but when you're uh, talking with your contractor, you're like, hey, when you work, when you do this work, uh -huh. this will be part of your exempted income. So even though you report it, you're not taxed on it if you make well, less than a certain amount. It depends where the contractor is and where the work's being performed. Ah, so okay. if the contractor's overseas yeah. and the work's performed overseas, then. Um, Unless they're a U.S. citizen, they're not going to have to file a U.S. tax return to report that income. The second comment is the important one, that the work was performed overseas. If or for a U.S. citizen or a... If the work is performed here, that is a different story. It's the place of performance. So it's where the work was performed. Not the, the nationality of the person performing the work. Right? Exactly. So oh. that's, that's a good point that you bring up because if there's a foreign national in the U.S. that's doing work in the U.S. He's subject to taxes. Well, he's subject to taxes, but the IRS puts the obligation on the payer to yeah. withhold tax and pay into the IRS on that person's behalf. But so is there an independent contractor? Doesn't matter. It's oh. uh, it's where the work is performed. So if he's actually physically present, he or she, uh, in the U.S. performing the work, then that's U.S. sourced income. So even if the individual is a foreign individual, they have U.S. sourced earnings that would require the person paying that individual to withhold tax and pay that into <laughs> taxes. You have right. to repay the taxes for that individual. But if there's an American citizen uh, or national living abroad and you're working as your independent contractor and you want to tell them, hey, the money I pay you, since I'm a principal or it's owned a foreign corporation, then that will, you can still earn so much money from a foreign corporation tax free outside of the United States. As a U.S. citizen or national, right? But that's that tax. Mm, well, yeah. it depends. I would if you want to say, hey, I wouldn't give them tax advice. This is an advantage. I, I think that's outside well, of the real. Oh, okay. I'm sorry. I, that's, but we're, we're working. <laughs> Tomas and I are working. I, I know, but I, yeah. I think that's outside of the real. Yeah. yeah, we have. Okay. Uh, there are some cards in the back table. If you want to grab one, yeah, and shoot me an email. I'd be happy to to chat with you about that in more detail. Yeah, I have one that can bring it very close to home. Uh, a lot of younger women translators have free time because of a young family that can work from home. Okay. But on some days, some jobs, they have to hire a babysitter because they got to get down to the computer. Mm -hmm. And then at the end of the year, do they have to provide a 1099 to the babysitter? Because it's work-related, it's not person's work-related. And can yes. they deduct that as an expense themselves? They can if so. If there are two spouses, both spouses have to be working, and the cost incurred for the babysitter has to be incurred to allow both spouses to be able to work. Um, but if it is an expense that you're incurring to allow you to work, then you can take a deduction for that. There's two ways to deduct it, either the 1099's contract labor, or as a household employee, if it's more of a nanny that's in-house and taking care of um, the, the, ch the child on a full-time basis, they're considered a household employee. So they would receive a W-2 and you would deduct that on your personal tax return. Um, I know we're, we're coming up against time. Um, five more slides. Five more slides. <laughs> <laughs> I told you it was going to be exciting. Yeah. So, Are these going to be on the ATO website so we can review Yes, yeah, so I think you have a copy, Marco. Uh, okay. I'm going to uh, get a, a copy out by email to everybody on the ATIA um, email list. So if you're on that, you can get one. Uh, a lot of the information we've covered, um, there's some information real quick on retirement plans. Um, you have the ability to set up retirement plans if you have your own business. Uh, SEP IRA is a popular one. You can put in 25% of your wages or up to 20% of your 
your self-employment income into your plan, but there are requirements if you have other employees that meet the certain criteria, you have to do it for the employees as well, and you can't just do it for yourself. How does that compare with a simple? Uh, simple is lower, it's 12,500 that you can put in. Uh, simple IRA, as the name implies, is simple to set up. Um, the SEP allows you, it applies for the SEP. So the SEP is either 25% of your wages or 20% of your net self-employment income. Whereas well, the simple, I mean, it's just I mean, uh, whatever you want, it's 12,500. 12,500, yeah, it's, it's a simple plan. They're not, they're not too common anymore. Most, are, most folks are trying to put in a higher level, so they go with the SEP or 401k. 401ks are good, but they, the administrative fees that you have for a 401k are, are higher. higher. So the SEP IRA is a good one, especially if you're um, self-employed. Uh, there's defined benefit pension plans that you can put in up to 240000 but there are a lot more restrictions on, on that. You have to have that level of income at least for the next five, ten years projected out. Uh, pensions are trying to get you to a certain level so that when you do draw on the pension, you're up at that level, so they allow for a higher amount to be paid in. Whereas the SEP is a contribution plan and they limit the contributions. Um, but any questions that you have, we have cards at the back. Uh, Marco, I think, is gonna send out the PowerPoint presentation so you might be able to actually see it. And uh, our contact information is on there, so if you have any questions, um, feel free to reach out. Thank you very much. Thanks again, Terry. Alright, thank you. Nobody fell asleep.